El Sombrero de Tres Picos, the three-cornered hat, or as it is often called by ballet companies in French, le tricorne. It was conceived when, in 1918, Sergei Diaghilev and his principal dancer and choreographer Leonid Massin were on tour in Spain. The great Spanish composer Manuel de Falla took them to see a performance of a farce for which he had written incidental music. When Diaghilev and Massin heard the strongly evocative Spanish folk character of Falla's music, they immediately invited him to make it the basis of a full-length ballet. They then remained in Spain, and they immersed themselves in the villages, the towns, books, monasteries, cathedrals, and everything else they could find in the country's indigenous culture. With them was Massin's new friend, the virtuoso young dancer Felix Fernández García, and also with them was Falia himself. He wanted to collect as much newly discovered authentic folk material as he could find. It was all a typically unique ballet russe situation. The genesis of something both strikingly authentic and thrillingly new, as they all set about creating a ballet on the story of the miller's wife who teases the mayor and chief magistrate of the village, the old Corregidor. His three-cornered hat is the symbol of his authority. Unfortunately, he fancies himself as a gigolo with comical consequences for himself, the miller, and the miller's wife. Here, she pretends to seduce the corregidor with a bunch of grapes, and he gets so excited that he loses his balance and he falls right over. Massin, describing his ballet, said, I began by stamping my feet repeatedly and twirling my hands over my head. As the music quickened, I did a series of high jumps, ending with a turn in midair and a savage stamp of the foot as I landed. And this is a long way from classical ballet. Throughout the dance, my movements were slow and contorted, and to the style and rhythm which I learned, I added many twisted and broken gestures of my own. Twisted and broken. Stamping, twisted, broken. Here we have an entirely new aesthetic. I felt instinctively that something more than perfect technique was needed here, but it was not until I had worked myself up into a frenzy that I was able to transcend my usual limitations. And this is the Miller's Dance, which is what Leonid Massin was describing.
during the war, the company had had periods in Spain, really quite long periods of Spain, in which Massine could immerse himself in Spanish dance, and he actually filmed Spanish dance to use as a source. So there was a real sort of sense of, I'm going to learn this, I'm going to be trained in it, working with the Spanish dancer Felix, for example, so that he could really sort of create something that was very Spanish. And Massin himself having an opportunity to really immerse themselves in that culture really informed the actual production. For a gloriously atmospheric décor to complete the Spanish authenticity, Diaghilev brought in the great Pablo Picasso to collaborate once again with the Ballet Russe, following his vividly striking designs, costumes and sets in Parade two years earlier. For the three-cornered hat, Picasso now painted a dazzling curtain. And also, in great contrast, he designed a quite stark decor to create a truly genuine Spanish village atmosphere. It was one of his very finest achievements, and it was to have far-reaching consequences later on. In the tricorn, Picasso did a grey and blue decor, which could give back the heavy, very severe atmosphere which was in Spain. And the tricorn also was a great inspiration to Dali afterwards and also to the cinema with the film Les Moulins with Sofia Loren, Marcello Mastroianni and Vittorio De Sica. The cuckoo sings in the night. It cautions us to bolt the door, for the devil is awake. Yet again, Diaghilev had brought together an extraordinary collaboration between some of the most highly acclaimed great talents of the time. And in this case, talents of artists who had some fundamentally very different outlooks. It was a most remarkable stroke of imagination. He had this genius for putting people together in such a way that they produced something surprising. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily put Falia and Picasso together. You know, admittedly, they were both Spanish, but beyond that, they didn't have much. I mean, Falia, as you know, was a very retiring, quiet, um, deeply religious composer, whereas Picasso was something rather different. <laughs> Diaghilev liberated the artists who worked with him. 
to do what they wanted most passionately to do. He liberated them to achieve great heights of creative acts. And this must have been very, very exciting. And perhaps it was why Picasso was drawn back to work with him more than once. I mean, this is something that was a sort of permission to put before the public one's individual powers in unison with somebody else's individual powers, to understand. And he made them understand each other. They understood what each wanted to do, and they did it together. Although Sergei Diaghilev was famous for his autocratic ways, he wasn't a dictator. As we've already heard, he did indeed have the exceptional creative ability to encourage very different kinds of people to express their own personal concepts and feelings and work together as individuals under his leadership. His genius was to choose the right person so you could really consider the Ballet Russe, in fact, is an incredible fabric uh, where all the people could uh, work without Diaghilev taking their identity because he never interfered, in fact, in the identity of all the surrounding people who were working with him and for him, of course. But this huge fabric was a fabric of magic, of dream. It was really a feast. the three-cornered hat opened at the Alhambra Theatre in London on July the 22nd, 1919, it immediately catalyzed a flood of new Spanish dance schools in the city. Yet again, the Ballet Russe had created a tremendously far-reaching impact, and yet again, it had happened with a completely individualistic work that was unlike anything else that the company, or any company, had hitherto produced. And... Yet again, once more, that situation was to recur in such a strikingly different way four years later. In 1923, now operating as the Bali Russe de Monte Carlo, the company now had a permanent home in Monte Carlo. These completely new sounds stunned the audience in the Théâtre de la Gaieté Lyrique in Paris when Igor Stravinsky returned and gave the world another of his greatest new masterpieces. And this was wholly unlike any of Stravinsky's previous ballets. Svadebka, Linos, The Wedding. Oh, my God. 